Take your Bible tonight, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 6 tonight. We're going to be at verse 10 again. We're dealing with part 4 of a message entitled, Having It All, Yet Having Nothing. And uh, we left off last week looking at the contemplations of a troubled man. And uh, we noted uh, in verse number 10, uh, contemplations about arguing with God. Look at verse 10 again. It says, That which hath been is named already, and it is known that is, ma that is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. So we started uh, looking at the arguments that men have today, uh, especially in relationship with the Lord. So we dealt last Wednesday night, we looked at the matter of creation. Men today argue about creation. Many believe in evolution, but the Bible says differently. The Bible tells us the truth, not a bunch of lies. And so uh, we talked about that. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. Men argue in matter of God's commands or His words. So let's pray. We'll get into this. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Bless our time in Your Word tonight. Help us to learn some things that will help us to be better Christians. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Solomon said in verse number 10, Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Now, if you are angry with God over some issue, arguing with him, judging him, or fighting against the Lord will be absolutely a waste of time. It will be futile. He is God. He is the Lord Almighty. You cannot outsmart the Lord or outtalk the Lord. Paul said this in Romans 9.20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You know, when men get bitter and hard-hearted or proud, they tend to start striving with the Lord. They get the attitude, God, who do you think you are? How dare you impose upon my life? You know, for men to judge the validity of God's actions is to imply that men are more righteous and smarter than the Lord. To judge the wisdom of God's movement is to imply that men are wiser than the Lord, and we know that's not true at all. Uh, Paul made it clear that God is not answerable to men for, for His will or what He does. He is God and He can do whatever He wants to do. Men argue and they debate about the authenticity of God's Word. The Scriptures are clear that the, that the Word of God came from the Spirit of God who gave His message to holy men of God. You either believe it or you don't. It's as simple as that. Your decision about what you believe about the Bible will affect what happens to your life here and in eternity. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The scriptures we have on our lap came from the Lord. He's the one that gave the message to holy men of God. Now scoffers, they argue and they contend that this book is a book of fables and that the Bible is not true at all. That's their argument. They act as a judge against the scriptures and declare them to be irrelevant, insignificant, inconsequential, immaterial, insubstantial, inadequate, intrusive, ineffective, illogical and idiotic to their own demise. Wickedness is embraced and God's wisdom and promises are spurned 
including the promise of Christ's return, which could be tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and come. 2 Peter 3, 3 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. You think we're there now? Oh, yeah. In the last days, scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, beloved, understand that fighting with God about His commands and snubbing your nose at the Lord and snubbing your nose as his, at His Word will leave you with a bloody nose, a turmoil, and even traumatic tear. The Bible is full of examples of what happened to men who scoffed at God. Noah was a preacher of righteousness who through the building of his ark preached that judgment was at hand. But the people ignored his message and because they did, they were all destroyed except Noah's family. Eight people survived the Genesis flood. When Moses warned of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, time after time, of the tragedy that would come unto his people if he didn't heed God's word, Pharaoh would receive the judgment and the land would suffer. Pharaoh ignored the word Moses gave to him and his nation suffered heartbreaking consequences. Could it be that we are suffering now in America because we have ignored God's word? I tell you, I think that's what's happening. King Ahab despised the word of the Lord, so God destroyed him in battle with a chance arrow. King Uzziah despised God's word, which said that only the priests were to serve in the temple. So God destroyed the king with leprosy after he entered that temple and burned incense. King Jehoiakim thought he could burn the Word of God, and get rid of its warnings. So God destroyed him and his family and gave him the burial of an ass, the Bible says. Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. And if you ignore him, you will be destroyed eternally. For those who have him, they have eternal life. And those who don't believe on Him, the Bible says they will suffer the wrath of God. Listen, if you die without Christ in your heart, if you die without Him, the Bible says you'll spend eternity in a place called hell. And you'll never get out. And you will rue the day that you said no to Jesus Christ. Despising the Word of God leads to failure. It leads to ruin. Now men are, argue about something else. They argue over the matter of God's control and course. Men strive with God about God's authority as God and His will. Man's opposition or unbelief, however, will not change what He wills. You can complain all you, you want, but God's going to do what He wants to do. God has His own plan or will for this world. But the Lord also has a plan, a will for your life too. It's a beautiful plan. God has something special for each person's life. He has a plan and it's, it's a wonderful plan if you will do what He's leading you to do, what He wants you to do. It is God's desire that we find His will and know His will for our lives and fulfill that will. This begins by trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're wanting to do the will of God in your life, it all begins with Jesus. In fact, the Bible says He's the alphabet. He's the A all the way to the Z. He's the Alpha, which is A, and Omega, that's the last letter. Jesus Christ is is the beginning and the end and everything in between. See, life is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, men are not lifeless clumps of clay that are shaped into eternal death or life. God does not make men in order to just go ahead and destroy them. Men destroy 
themselves when they refuse to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, men have a will. Clay does not. We have feelings, intellect, emotions, and the God-given privilege to choose. We are not puppets without moral responsibility. Our choices that we make determine our destiny in our life. We are responsible for the choices we make. Don't go around blaming everybody else for the problems that you've got. You are responsible for the decisions that you make in your life. If we choose to reject the Lord, then we seal our doom. We also miss out on the plan that God had for us and the blessings that accompany that plan. That is, that's a tragedy for anyone to miss out on what God had for them. Don't miss out on what God has for you. Find out what God's will is for your life and do His will. Do it! Do it! C.S. Lewis said, To walk out of God's will is to walk into nowhere. Wow, that's a powerful statement. When you walk away from God, you may have it all, but yet have nothing. If you're willing to do God's will, He will show it to you. When He does, then do it instead of fighting it. Just do what He says. You know, there was an old Scottish woman that traveled around the countryside selling her housewares Whenever she came to a, a fork in the road, she would throw a straw into the air, and when it dropped to the ground, she would proceed in the direction indicated by the, the pointing of the straw. The residents of the area knew of her strange custom. But one day, a friend saw her tossing the straw into the air several times before choosing the path that she would take. So he inquired, he said, why did you throw that straw into the air more than once? And she replied, oh, it kept pointing to the road on the left and I wanted to go the other way because it looked much smoother. She had continued casting her straw to the wind until it fell in the direction she wanted to go. Now, many Christians have a tendency to have the exact same attitude toward the will of God in their life. I'll do it as long as it's agreeable. I'll do what God wants me to do as long as it's convenient for me. Uh, beloved, may we learn to not argue with God over His will and His plans for our life. Now, something else that men argue about. Men argue about the condemnation and the judgment of God. If you have been around for any length of time, you probably have heard two common statements about hell. Number one, there is no hell at all. There's a lot of people that believe that. Number two, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? I've heard both of those my entire lifetime. The wickedness and arrogance of men provokes their rejection of God's judgment and condemnation of sin. He's a holy God. Men do not feel they are accountable to God in any way. That's why there are so many that live wicked, vile, ungodly lives. They don't think they're accountable to God. They resent God's moral boundaries that condemn their perversity or they'll resent any preacher that gets up and preaches against them. They'll take their, their anger out on the preacher. Uh, no matter how many objections that are raised against God's judgment, we all will face His judgment. The Christ that they blaspheme will be their judge and they will bow to Him one day. See, Christ is the judge, beloved. John 5, 22. For the Father, talking about God the Father, 
For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That's Jesus. Philippians 2.9, here's how Paul put it. Wherefore God also hath, hath highly exalted him. He's talking about Jesus. And given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and get this, and things under the earth. And that's an interesting statement. And that every tongue should confess, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Unsaved sinners will face judgment at what is called the great white throne judgment. They will be condemned to hell for eternity. They are at that judgment because they did not know Christ as their Savior. John said in Revelation 21 verse 8, the last book of the Bible, he says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Beloved, hell is a very real place. Christians will also give an account of their lives, but their judgment is at the judgment seat of Christ. Salvation is not the issue at the judgment seat of Christ because everyone there has been saved. It's only for Christians. The matter of rewards will be the issue at the judgment seat of Christ. Christ will determine what was valuable and what was worthless what was as gold, silver, and precious stones, or what was worthless like wood, hay, and stubble. And believe me, he, the judge, will determine what is valuable and what is not valuable. I understand what we think is valuable, he doesn't value. Uh, what we think was important, he may not consider to be important. And what we didn't think is important, he considered to be important. We'll find that out at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Paul said, for we must, uses that word must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Now, we've been examining the contemplations of a troubled man. We looked at the advantage questions, the attitude of appreciation, we have just finished looking at arguing, arguing, with, arguing with God. Now we're going to look at the assessment of many words. Look at Ecclesiastes 6, look at verse 11. He says, Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? Now, in, he, in verse 11 there, that word things is an interesting word. It's from the word debar, which means this. It means words, speech, utterance. Solomon stated that many words or arguments increase the ineffectiveness of those words. They weaken what is said which leads to little accomplishment or benefit. They offer no advantage. Solomon spoke about this issue in the book of Proverbs indicating the wisdom of saying little and the foolishness of running your mouth all the time. Have you ever met anybody like that before? Huh? Someone? They start, they start talking. I hear laughter in this corner over here. <laughs> Someone, sometimes people get going and they just won't stop, you know. Uh, too much talk leads to sin and offensive words. How many of you already found that out? Say amen. Oh my, God help us, deliver us Lord of foot and mouth disease. Please help us Lord. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. Proverbs 10.19, 
In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Transgression and offenses are unavoidable in the multitude of words. Too many words can create problems for us. Oh, amen to that. Sooner or later, we, we are going to say something we should not have said. Have you ever been in that boat? Oh, boy, I have. This is why we should demonstrate self-control and be quiet. In fact, the Arabic word for refraineth in verse 11 there, or, or excuse me, in uh, verse 19, Proverbs 10, 19, that word refraineth is used in reference to placing, get this, to placing a piece of wood in the mouth of a goat to prevent the goat from sucking. Listen, if you don't have control over your tongue, Maybe if you put a piece of wood in your mouth, you won't put your foot in it. Amen. You know, the shortest inaugural address was given by the endeared George Washington. It contained, that speech, his presidential inaugural speech, contained only... 135 words. I mean, he was up and he was done. William H. Harrison, he was the president that delivered the longest inaugural speech. It was 9,000 words. It took two hours. A freezing northeast wind made everything about his speech seem long. Such verbosity caught up with President Harrison. The next day, he came down with a cold, and he died a month later from pneumonia. Wow. Beloved, refraining your lips is wise and will develop wisdom as you learn from other people. Abraham Lincoln, ever heard of him, huh? He said, it is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. May the Lord help us all to have control over our tongues. And believe me, in our own strength and power, we'll struggle to do that. It's the Spirit of God that will help us to put the bridle in our mouth. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Proverbs 17, 27. He that hath knowledge spareth his words. You know, the word spareth is from the word kasak, which carries more intensity in the Hebrew language. It means this. That word spareth means to keep it in check, to hold something back, to, to restrain. It is the same word that David used in Psalm 19.13, where he said, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Like a police officer handcuffing a criminal, we are to handcuff by the grace of God our words. In so doing, we will be considered wise and a person of understanding, even though we might not be that smart. Someone said, most entanglements are caused by vocal cords. For this reason, don't speak unless you can improve the silence. Those are good words. Those are good advice. You know, there's something else we see here in verse number 12, Ecclesiastes 6, 12. The attention demands care now and in the future. Look at verse 12. For who knoweth what is good... For man in this life, 
all the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Being filled with skepticism, Solomon wrestled with doubt about God's care over his life. He struggled to trust the Lord. That is why he asked these questions. He asked, who knows what is good for a man in his lifetime? The answer is obvious. God knows what is best for all of us. He knows where we have been. He knows where we are now. And he knows where we are going. Job talked about this. He said in Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take. God knows your way too. Psalm 1.6, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Solomon noted the brevity, the shortness of life. That is a matter that we should consider each day, just how short life is. I mean, we just had a church fellowship on Sunday night, and we're here on Wednesday night just like that. I mean, it's just just like that. You know, James said in James 4.14 that life is a vapor, just like the mist that comes out of those machines back there, and then it's gone. Job said in Job 7.6, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Psalm 89.47, Remember how short... My time is. Psalm 102, 3. For my days are consumed like smoke. Since it is short and since it's fast, we better hang on to the Lord and live our days wisely. We better follow the one who knows where he's going. God knows where he's going. We need to follow him. David put it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I hope that he's the shepherd of your life and you're letting him lead you. Tony Evans said there are many people today who consider themselves young. If I take a group of 20-somethings and ask them if they are young, most, if not all, would raise their hands, yeah, I'm young. There is only one problem, Tony said. You cannot measure your age by your birthday. You can only measure your age by your death date. See, if you're 35 and you're only going to live to be 40, then you're an old man. If you are 45 and going to live to be 90, then you're still pretty young. You can only measure how old you are by the time that you have left before you die. Now, who knows when you are going to die? Basically, nobody knows. So no one really knows who is old and who is not. You can be a teenager in this room tonight, but you may be an old person because maybe you'll die when you're young. I think of Stacy Smith. Stacy was a teenager that uh, I used to be her youth pastor, used to be her Christian school teacher too, had such a sweet spirit. She loved the Lord. Well, <clears throat> when she was around 16, uh, the youth group that she was in at that time went to a church camp. And uh, there was a terrible, terrible rainstorm that took place. And the rivers began to start to flood. And they, they warned the kids to get out of the camp else the river would flood and they would not be able to get out because the river went over the camp road. So they, they loaded up the bus and they started taking off to get out of the camp. And just as that bus was crossing that river road, a wall of water came down the river. It was huge and it slammed into that bus and washed it down the river. I believe there was around 40 kids in that bus. <clears throat> there was, I believe, 10 to 12 kids that drowned in that, that 
tragedy. And Stacy was one of them. And so was her sister, Tanya. That mother lost both of her girls in that flood that swept down the river. When they were teenagers, they were old girls. They were old ladies, thinking perhaps they had their whole life ahead of them to serve the Lord, but no. God took them home on that day. See, you just never know, do you? Beloved, life is short. We need to make each day count for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know him not as your Savior, don't put that off anymore. You put your faith in him today. See, you can have it all, but if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you really have nothing at all. Let's pray.